Dr. Teo, thank you for agreeing to come on and talk to me again. Um, it's been some time since we last chatted, and I, if I recall from the last time we chatted, you had um, told me about the fact that you were doing a lot of research in the various uh, kinds of um, female cancers, uh, female breast cancers specifically, and you were trying to prove whether, um, in fact, um, female cancer patients in Asia had a different um, strain or different uh, variation to that found in, in the West, right? So I, what I understand from your emails to me is that you have proven to that to be the case, and I guess that will form the basis of our discussion today. So maybe you can tell it to me better than what I just described it to you. Thank you so much, Chuang, and thank you for welcoming back me back to your program. I think it's really nice to be back and also to be able to see a beach and feel as if we are somewhat different from where we are actually stuck in some cubby hole and a study room in our own offices. But let's let's talk about what we set out to do. Well, when you know we the way we know cancers in the past is to really understand where it occurs geographically. If it occurs in the breast, we think of it as one disease. And we start to look under a microscope and look that certain cells look different from each other and the cells which are different, patients respond to different types of therapy. But even then, we discovered that you know, patients are given the same therapy um, when they have cells that look the same under a microscope, but they respond differently. For years, we never really understood why some patients have a very poor outcome to disease and why some patients have a very good outcome to the disease. So we, to be able to improve survival, we need to understand this, what we call heterogeneity in cancer, differences between the cancers itself. So to be able to do that, we need to understand even deeper, not just look at where it occurs, not just look under a microscope, but scratch below the surface and understand what's gone wrong with the genes and how can we understand the different types of cancer. So the research that had been conducted in the West had found that there may be 10 different types of breast cancer, and each of those different types respond differently to different types of treatment. But almost all of the research at that time had been conducted in the European population. That means women of European descent, either from North America or from Europe. And at the time that we started the work, only 2% of the research was done in Asians. So we set up to change that. In 2015, it was only 2%. Today, because of the research that's done in Cancer Research Malaysia, it is 20%. So 20% of the genomic profiles of our understanding of the underlying genetics between, behind breast cancers in Asians was conducted right here in Asia. What did we find? We found three important things. Number one, we found that an aggressive type of breast cancer called HER2 positive breast cancer is a lot more common in Asians compared to Caucasians. And this suggests that we need to be able to make sure that the type of therapy that's available for this disease is available for all Asian women. But importantly, we know almost nothing about why this disease occurs. Why are Asians more likely to get the disease and how can we prevent this disease more effectively? So this is going to be a major area of research for us in the future. The second thing that we found is that a, a gene that's called the guardian of the genome, this is a gene that helps a cell normally take a stop and pause and repair DNA before damage propagates and more cancers develop. And this gene is more commonly mutated in Asian women. And we, today, we know very little about why that might be the case. And we also know very little about what implications that might have on treatment. And there was a third finding. The third finding was that we found that Asian women are more likely to have immune cells that infiltrate and come within the vicinity of a cancer cell. But somehow those immune cells don't recognize the cancer as a foreign enemy that needs to be destroyed. And they're just living side by side with the cancer cells. So we can find some way of reactivating those immune cells to be able to attack the cancers. We might find some way of being able to hopefully cure the cancers more effectively. And this is exactly what we're taking forward in a clinical trial called the oral clinical trial together with University of Malaya as well as National University Hospital. So it's really a prime example of how by having the vision of setting up a sample collection, doing all of the detailed analysis with genomics, using the information to then translate into new therapeutic Asian uh, treatment options for patients and bringing it forward into clinical trials is really fulfilling the promise of why is it that Cancer Research Malaysia exists. I understand you've been doing this for a long time, Dr. Teo. Um, in fact, you made headlines back in the day when you were at Cambridge. I think you were at Cambridge and you, and you graduated, I think, first class honours and you've been, basically, you've devoted your life to the cause for a number of years. And th in fact, probably a couple of decades, right? Um, and you've been able to find out what you found out for breast cancer. 
I I want to find out from it from a very personal perspective as well, which I think you know. My my sister did pass away from cancer, albeit from lung cancer, right? But it seems to be very prevalent among Asian Chinese women specifically. You know what you found with lung cancer, uh, for with for breast breast cancer for Asian females, and those variances and those vagaries, right? Do you think those vagaries might be occurring in lung cancer as well, for Asian females? <laughs> Absolutely. Without a doubt, I think that Asians are different from Caucasians on three fronts. Number one, our genetics. That means the, the genes that we inherit that influence our risk of disease is different, right? And clearly, there's not enough research on the underlying genetics in any population other than the European population, simply because the majority of research is conducted in the European population, in, be it in Europe or in North America. Number two, we now have a lot of evidence that our lifestyle factors and even the bugs that are that are in our gut influences how our immune systems react to uh, ca cancer development and so on. And there's just so little research that's conducted on the Asian population to understand how the food that we eat influences the microbiome and the, the and the bugs that live within us that influences our ability of our immune system to be able to fight diseases as well as influences the ability of our immune system to be able to respond to treatment options and so on. And then number three, it really relates to all of the other aspects that, that are really important in terms of our lifestyle risk factors. So the environment in which we live, you know, has got carcinogens that influences our risk of disease. And we still know very little in our own population as to how it is that we might be able to prevent more cancers in our own population. So what do we need to do? You know, you mentioned that it takes a long time to do this type of research. Absolutely right. We started our breast cancer research program in 2003. It took us more than 10 years to be the largest study among the Asian population. We started our breast cancer genomics program in 2012, and our study was only published eight years later in 2020, in three days before, before um, Christmas last year, it finally got published in Nature Communications, right? So it takes a long time for us to get there. And to be able to do this type of work, A, we need to have the vision that it is possible to get it started. B, we need to have be able to invest long term and not expect quick solutions. Ex invest long term in order to be able to do the work that will really make a difference. Because if we keep investing in things that are very, very short term, we will never be able to make those significant breakthroughs that really lay the foundation for changing practices and enabling a lot more work to be conducted that can then impact on the lives of patients. Okay, so from a funding perspective, right? Um, if the funder were to ask you questions like, um, what kind of um, funding requirements does Cancer Research Malaysia need on an annual basis? Uh, if the funder were to ask you things like, um, where does the money go? Uh, what kind of patients uh, levels does he or she need? Uh, what kind of results can he or she re um, find um, results at the end of the day? Um, the, I mean, these would be typical questions, and of course, it's it's uh, it's not for profit, right? It's it's basically for for medical uh, discovery, right? So, yeah. how would you respond to these things? Well, I think for for us, the the biggest challenge in in any research organization doesn't matter whether you're in Malaysia or elsewhere. It's always about talent. If and it's actually about ensuring that you can provide the talent to come together in and in, in systematic programs that make a difference. So about 60% of our funding goes towards employing scientists, training those scientists, training young people to become future scientists, training doctors to understand how to do research and how to be involved in clinical trials, how to be able to interact with the international community, and then ensuring that we're able to continue to collaborate with the best teams globally and making sure that it's not just about training Malaysians, by ensuring that we have the right partnerships with the globally the best teams to bring the best brains to solve the problems within the Asian population. And we're doing all of that by making sure that we take it stepwise. So initially, it might be starting out small projects that are only nationally significant, right? We're only addressing things which are only relevant in our area. Then it's, after that, it's about real, building those international collaborations that enable us to address internationally significant questions. But then at, at a different level, it's also about addressing things that only matter in terms, of, uh, in, in terms of adding to the body of scientific knowledge versus the type of research that enables us to change clinical practice. So what I mean by that is 
I might be doing research to understand how cells behave. But understanding how cells behave do very little for a patient who wants to know what treatment will work for me. So you need to take the discovery all the way from understanding what happens to a cell to understanding how that discovery will make a difference on the treatment options to understanding how do you test those treatment options in clinical trials and then how do you make those uh, new treatment options available for patients. And in each step of the way, it's a different sort of solution that is required, which is why research takes such a long time because the worst thing that we can do is to give treatment experimentally to a patient when that doesn't, that doesn't work. Because ultimately, you will A, not only destroy their chances, but deny them the opportunity of a treatment that may work half as well as your experimental therapy. So we have to proceed very cautiously. What is the upside to the funding organization? I think the upside is the reality is that um, medical research is the only way that's going to change the future. I'm going to repeat this. Medical research is the only way we're going to change the future. We can reach out and help patients today. And absolutely, we should go out, reach out and help patients today because there's so many individuals that are affected by cancer. But the reality is if we keep helping patients today and we don't set aside some to change the future, then in the next five years, we're potentially going to have twice as many cancer patients. How much can our bottom dollar stretch to be able to help those patients? We need to set aside some funding to be able to change the future so that we can control cancers more effectively, more cost effectively, so that we can prevent more cancers, so that we can extend treatment options and extend survival, so that people can go back to the workforce and contribute to the economy and so on and so forth. So my plea is really to, to look at the charitable sector, not just as one that feeds the poor, feeds the needy, all of which are very worthy causes, but sets aside something for sustainable building, sustainability of building that future, right? 40 years ago, you know, when you and I were born 50 years ago, Chua, 50 years ago when you and I were born, uh, only one in four cancer patients would survive 10 years. Today, it's two in four cancer patients will survive 10 years. That's made possible because of medical research. If we don't invest in further medical research, how are we going to continue to improve the survival of cancer patients? The only way that I know is to be able to invest in medical research that will make a difference, as well as invest in the type of behavior change and awareness programs that ensures that the population moves with us in destigmatizing cancer and ensuring that cancer is a disease that we can talk about and that we can fight together. You know, in the last few months since we last spoke, right, Dr. Teo, um, what have your findings been in terms of the trend line where um, cancer, I don't know, victims or ca cancer cases have, have been, have they been rising, have they been falling? I mean, of course, it's a very short trend line, but what is just the feedback there? In the short term, cancer ca cases will not increase dramatically simply because cancer takes many, many years to develop. So just because of the pandemic and just because we're in lockdown, doesn't mean that the cancer cases will, the trajectory will change dramatically. It's not suddenly going to rise exponentially, et cetera. But where the big difference is, is in the stage of presentation of the disease. So in the past, many more individuals would have come forward for screening. But now people want to hesitate from going for a health screen, going for a screen, for be it for colorectal cancer, lung cancer, breast cancer, et cetera. People hesitate from going to the hospital. People hesitate from getting investigations done if they have a lung. And as a consequence, we will feel the net effect of this pandemic on cancer outcomes in the years to come because people are going to present later and later with disease. And many of the advances that we've made in terms of getting people to screen for cancer and come early may have been rolled backwards as a consequence of the reluctance to go out and the reluctance to get investigations because they're deemed to be unnecessary during a time of a pandemic. And we're already seeing that to happen. So in, in a number of hospitals, there have been anecdotal evidence that patients are presenting late. Patients have gone off for alternative medicines because they are fearful of coming to the hospital. And all of these is going to set us, roll us back, not in terms of incidents, but in terms of outcomes and survival from cancer. Wow. Okay. So that makes for sobering um, consumption. Dr. Teo, in the absence of further tests and in the absence of all the years of uh, additional research that is required, um, what kind of advice would you give to people, not just women, but you know, generally everybody, right, to reduce the possibility of um, you know, um, contracting cancer? I would 
would say there are three things that people can do. Number one, stop smoking. Stop smoking, stop smoking. Maybe I should say there are three things, stop smoking, stop smoking, stop smoking. But number one, in terms of preventability, is definitely stop smoking. Number two is vaccination is really important. So if you haven't been vaccinated for the human papilloma virus and you are either female or even male under the age of 45, you should really consider vaccination. If you're at high risk of hepatitis B, you should also consider re-vaccination for hepatitis B. And currently, healthcare workers already have access to that. So if you're dealing with health, uh, we are dealing with blood products and so on, it's something that you should really consider. And then number three is really physical activity and diet. And physical activity is a lot more important than diet. So more, most of us are much more concerned about how we look and about what we eat rather than our physical activity. So uh, unfortunately, very few people realize that uh, a bigger person, you know, a, a fatter person who is, um, who is physically more active actually has a lower risk of cancer than a skinny individual that is physically inactive. So physical activity does something to our hormonal systems as well as the immune systems in ways that we don't yet fully understand that can significantly reduce our risk of cancer. And it's more important for us to really think about how do we become more physically active. And this, the pandemic has been not good for us on that front because, because we're staying at home, stress levels have gone up. Smoking, unfortunately, anecdotally, it suggests that smoking has gone up. I don't know about you, Chuang, but I've had Zoom calls with some of my friends and not much so much with the females, I think, with the girlfriends that I have, but a lot more with the male friends that I have and the husbands of my, my friends and so on. They tend to have put on quite a lot of weight and been physically terribly inert as a consequence of the pandemic over the past year, right? The lockdown has meant that just the fact that they don't stand up in their office, etc., and they're sitting in front of the computer, sitting in front of the TV, means that people have put on a tremendous amount of weight and the physical activity has absolutely plummeted. So I think the advice to the people out there is really, you know, stop smoking, be physically active, and vaccinations is really, if it's, it's warranted in your age group, uh, then certainly go ahead and do that. Well, you've told me a lot. You've told me a lot in basically fifteen minutes, Doctor Joe. Again, every time I talk to you, I I'm blown away by the passion, the dedication, and I guess basically the the, the instructional value of what you've just told me. So again, um, good luck with the um, research. Um, I look forward to talking to you again. And um, really, please please do keep on doing what you're doing. I think it's, it's highly valuable for not just for Malaysia but also for the country, for the region as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tom. Nice to be on your show again. Bye bye. Okay. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.